Women have been giving birth for centuries, so it's a pretty natural experience, right? Wrong. I'm Stephanie King, professional doula, childbirth educator, and the creator of the My Essential Birth Course, the online childbirth education course that's helping women everywhere confidently achieve their best birth. Today's culture would have us think that birth should be treated like an illness or an emergency, and that most of us need other people telling us what's best for our bodies because we aren't the experts. So sit tight, because if you're tuning into this podcast, you'll probably start to believe in your body, your intuition, and find yourself empowered and confident to do what it takes to have the birth of your dreams. If you like listening to me take you through these weekly topics step by step, then you're going to love the My Essential Birth course. Make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast and definitely head over to myessentialbirth.com for the free downloads mentioned right here in these episodes and to join the birth course and community full of pregnant moms just like you. I have to add a disclaimer that I am not a medical professional and I cannot provide medical advice. All of the information expressed in this podcast are based off of personal, professional, and educational experiences and are my own opinions. Please work with a provider you trust for medical advice during your pregnancy and birth. Welcome back, you guys, to this week's Pregnancy and Birth Made Easy podcast. I have a reviewer of the week for you, and it is Courtney Clare. She says, love, love, love this podcast. I love this podcast so much, not only as a pregnant mama myself, but as a registered labor and delivery nurse. Stephanie does such a great job at covering all the relevant and important topics in digestible segments of information, and then turning that information into concrete resources and talking points for women to bring to their birth team and offers such a great balance of clinical and quote unquote crunchy. Thank you for the work that you do to get this essential information into the hands of mom everywhere. Thank you, Courtney, for leaving that review. And I'm excited to offer some more evidence-based, excellent conversation today. Um, Today, I and I want to say something I think we probably don't spend enough time on truly is talking about pelvic health specifically during pregnancy and birth. I talked to you guys on a a bunch of topics all day long about pregnancy and birth, including how to work with your body and what's happening inside and even things about your baby. Um, And I want to focus today on pelvic floor care. And if you're anything like me, that means you probably have never heard of this. (laughs) I did not hear about pelvic floor stuff or pelvic therapy until well after I had my third baby, which was such a bummer. So I don't want you guys to have that excuse and lucky for you today, that's about to change. I have with me two incredible pelvic floor therapists. I will let them introduce themselves in a moment, but they are going to dive into some information that I think is going to be useful for everybody listening, things that you can take home, digest, and get using today. So without further ado, um, Amanda and Marin, will you take a moment and introduce yourselves? Tell us a little bit about what you do, a little about your background, your professional side of things, personal side of things, and let's dive in. Hi, I'm Amanda Fisher. I'm owner of Empower Your Pelvis. It's a pelvic floor physical therapy clinic out in Kansas City, Missouri, so south side of Kansas City. And we've been open five years now, which is pretty amazing. I got into pelvic floor because I was having pelvic floor issues myself. And a lot like the rest of us, we didn't know this thing existed. So I had developed pain with sex in my early 20s. What a bummer. And total buzzkill and realizing when the doc would tell me to go drink a glass of wine or two to calm down the pelvic floor so we could have sex, it wasn't working. It was causing me to pass out versus actually enjoy the moment. So researched it myself a little bit more, found out it was within my profession. And at the time, I was actually in physical therapy school and decided to start specializing in it. And lo and behold, 13 years later, here I am. And I myself have had three kiddos. So I've gone through the pregnancy thing three times. And nine years ago was my first. And it nine years ago, we didn't talk about pelvic floor. We still jumped back into exercises way too soon. We thought six weeks postpartum was still a thing. Um, then seven years ago was my second. It still kind of was you know, following that same trend. Four years ago was my third, and then people really started talking about it. I think that's when I noticed it more, um, and I remember even being in the hospital being like, aren't you going to do this? Aren't we going to do that? Why are we not checking this or cueing people on this and that? And then decided to you know, really jump in and start honing into that with what we're doing here in our practice on how we're really 
paying attention um, to our pregnancy population as our prehabbers on how can we prep our body for birth for that, you know, big event. Like at the end, we're just kind of going into it that it could be a beautiful race or we may end up injuring our tissue like we do in a marathon where we might sprain an ankle or develop an IT band pain. And that's kind of how we like to look at childbirth, like knowing there's something at the end, but how can we prep for the beautiful race in it? That's awesome. And I am Marin Cole, and I've been a physical therapist for about three years. Um, I actually had a clinical rotation when I was in school with a pelvic floor specialist, and that's honestly what got me into it. Um, I was just really inspired by working with um, people who were experiencing pain with sex and pregnant women and postpartum, and it was just a population I really hadn't been exposed to in school. Um, And so as soon as I graduated, I started taking courses and moved around a little bit. I lived in Chicago and that's where I got started. Um, And then I moved out here about a year and a half ago. And I've been (laughs) at Empower Your Pelvis ever since. Um, It's been wonderful. And it's something I, I think all of us here are extremely passionate about what we do. We would not be able to treat the same population all day, every day if we weren't. Um, And of course, every patient's different. We see men, we see women. Um, we see pregnancy, we see postpartum, we see kids, we see Menopausal. the geriatric. Yeah. So we see really across the whole spectrum of age population, but pregnancy and postpartum is obviously something we see a lot of. Um, and I'm also pregnant. So I'm 39 weeks in one day today. Yay. So it's been a very different nine months of treating. It's been really different to be on the other side of it. Um, that's actually how I found out about this podcast. Um, is going through my own journey, which has been super inspiring for me. And it's it's just taught me kind of to talk to my patients differently, which I think has really been inspirational. And I can really help to empower them even further than I could before. Um, so it's been it's been fun being pregnant and treating pregnant patients. Yeah, I so love that. that. And I know can- postpartum is going to be different. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, it makes me like I, I can ask you a question because I that's so interesting. And I didn't think about you like, oh, I'm being pregnant and I, how you treat them or like what you're noticing for yourself. So was there anything that popped up that you're like, oh, I've been teaching this a certain way, but actually I noticed it like this or have you had anything like that that has been kind of a neat experience for you? I would say the biggest things have been So something we talk about with our patients day one, really, no matter who they are, because everyone could use help with it, is breathing. Mm -hmm. We always talk about breathing with our patients and we always educate and we'll talk about this, I'm sure today, Kegels and all how the pelvic floor moves and everything. And I always educated my patients on that. But I think I educate my pregnant patients a little bit different than I did before Mm -hmm. because I just understand it better now, kind of preparing for birth myself because yeah. I, I kind of, you know, I always knew that the pelvic floor needed to relax going into labor, but just what I've learned for myself, it's been just emphasized even more in everything I've learned and read and everything. So I can speak to it a little bit more strongly now with those patients. And I, not that they didn't believe me before, but now I think they're really like, I didn't realize how important it was. <laughs> I thought I should be contracting my pelvic floor and tightening it before. Um, so that's a really big one is just kind of when I explain breathing and preparing for labor delivery, I, I'm more passionate about it than I was before. Um, and I also, honestly, from just like reading and your podcast and everything, I am really big on talking to patients about advocating for themselves. Mm-hmm. There's a lot we can't educate them on or necessarily tell them what to do um, from a medical standpoint. And so I'm, I'm really big on if they have a question, I'm like, call your doctor, go talk to your doctor, ask them if you're concerned about this, don't wait. Um, I educate them on, you know, what they, what are their rights and what, what they're able to decide on themselves and what's normal, what's not normal. So I think that's been huge for me is being able to, yes, help them prepare their muscles. And if they have back pain, help with their pain, but also just really empowering them from a different level. And I like that. Can I chime in there too? (laughs) Yeah. I, I think so having gone through it and then having kids myself, my biggest takeaway too was the mom is so overwhelmed, even though they may not realize it. And we don't want to overwhelm them even more. So I used mm-hmm. to give them a crap ton of exercises <laughs> and I expected them to get them done. Now being a mom of three young boys, I mean, it, that shifted very quickly into my mother, motherhood career where it was like, why am I doing that? Why do I expect you to do all these things? 
when I know I couldn't even do that. So it's yeah. very much like cutting back what we're giving them and telling, like giving them grace. And so now a lot of our exercises that we give out to, are, it's to deal more with functional motherhood techniques or activities that they're already doing. So I like to give them like five things that we do as moms every day during pregnancy or postpartum is we look at the squatting and hinging of like picking up the laundry basket, picking up the car seat and preparing them for that. Like what it's going to look like strength wise, how can we practice that during pregnancy? Hinging to get the baby out of the bassinet or crib. What does that look like and how can we modify that during pregnancy to prep that for childbirth? Um, Pushing and pulling. So us um, using our body to grab the baby and pull it towards us and then put the baby back in the bassinet. So how Mm -hmm. how are we gonna strengthen this upper body for that? And then the farmer's made carry. How we hold baby on our left or our right side or that car seat or the diaper bag can really, during pregnancy, if we can prep for that for even postpartum for what that's gonna look like for the fourth trimester is huge. And so a lot of times allowing moms to do those activities that they're already doing all day and not giving them extra. So it's like when you're changing your baby's diaper, that's when I want you to practice this and this. And they're like, oh my God, thank you so much because I'm overwhelmed and I'm not sleeping. And I feel like I haven't had, you know, support. Like you're like, just slow it down. You're already doing these things, but let's, let's modify them to do it the correct way or to prep you Mm -hmm. for that activity. So we're not giving you a thousand other things to think about throughout the day. And that's been huge, but that Mm -hmm. took me having to go through that myself. Well, I love that. I love that you can come from that place of, you know, I have children myself. I get it. Here's how we're going to make it work because that's what moms need. You're 100 percent. Okay, so kind of starting into that, then why don't we talk about because we're saying pelvic floor therapy and talking about a couple of things. But maybe people are like, wait, what is pelvic floor therapy and what kind of training do you guys even need to go through to be able to to perform that to help weather women? So in our office, pelvic floor therapy, we specialize in pelvic floor dysfunction. So your pelvic floors are supposed to hold back urine, hold back gas. And then when we want them to release urine or release bowel movements, they should be able to do so with us without us having to bear down or really have to work at it. Um, They should support our organs. So they should hold our bladder, our uterus and our bowel in the right spot. They should should stability wise be able to support our movement without any pain or dysfunction. They should allow us to have orgasms and intercourse without pain and dysfunction um, and then work with our diaphragm to really create what we call like a sump pump. So whenever there, when you, it's, it kind of irks us a little bit when you hear like, oh, it's normal. I peed my pants after I had a baby. Well, <laughs> no, it's common. It happens to a lot of people, but the normal <laughs> side of it is that it actually, those pelvic floor mu- muscles should normally keep that stuff in, right? right? Until we say it's okay for it to come out. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably the basis. However, what we do at our clinic, we're very orthopedically, um, orthopedic clinic. So we look at the pelvis and what's attached to the pelvis. And we also look at the spine. So if anybody's having low back pain, we tend to see that that correlates with that pelvic floor dysfunction. Hip pain correlates with that pelvic pain dysfunction or pelvis. um, And then anything down the kinetic chain as well. So we're really working neck, shoulders, really the whole um, ensemble when it comes to our Mm -hmm. patients. When they come in, we're looking at giving it a whole body approach. Mm -hmm. And I think Sometimes people people will think they have hip or low back or SI or tailbone that they don't need to see us, but really that comes into everything that we do. Mm-hmm. Um, training wise, do you want to give yeah. us some insight on that? So training wise, we all obviously went to different schools, and um, we're not taught a ton in school because it's not something that a lot of people. It's like a forty specialize. minute presentation. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Oh man. We learn pretty much <laughs> where the pelvic floor is and when to refer out um, is what we learn, and so. Upon graduation or whenever you get interested in pelvic health, you um, there's kind of two different routes that a lot of us have taken. So you get your doctorate in physical therapy. Yes. So you get your doctorate in physical therapy first. Um, You can take the courses during school, but most people wait. Um, And so we can either take courses through somewhere called Herman and Wallace or the APTA, which is our physical therapy association. They're very similar tracks. Um, it's just two different organizations that are that are out there for us to have options. Okay. Um, so you take kind of the I call them like the basic courses just to teach you how to do an internal assessment, um, what the pelvic floor is, things like that. And then the next course is pain and then bowel. 
So those are kind of the main ones that most people take to be able to treat pretty much anyone in that population of pelvic floor dysfunction. And then we're all, like I said, we're very passionate about what we do. So we're taking courses all the time, whether it's to learn how to help with nerve pain or um, diastasis or pregnancy, fertility, few, fertility yeah. endometriosis, um, oncology. So there's tons of other little courses you can take through those organizations um, just to further your education. And a few of us also have um, something called a pregnancy and postpartum specialty certification that we've taken, um, which has been really great because, again, we do treat a lot of that population. And what's great about that course that we've all taken is it's actually not treating any internal. So it's all the orthopedic mm-hmm. side, nice. side, exercise, things like that. So like what Amanda was saying, we're, we look at the full body. We don't just people always say, get your head out of the pelvis because <laughs> a lot of, a lot of times we're like, okay, pelvic floor, let's check it. Yeah. And for some people that's completely appropriate. Um, but once we start working with our patients, we find out like, okay, maybe their job is actually affecting because they're bending and lifting all day long or they're sitting all day long or things like that. So, um, that's awesome. And you guys, we, yeah, sorry. You guys have a, um, a podcast as well. I forgot to mention that. So you guys just mentioned the podcast really quick so that, cause I want people to be able to, um, I don't want to say self-diagnose, but it's really helpful to hear other people talk about topics that you wouldn't have thought of before. And especially when you're referring to like, oh, maybe I need to see a pelvic floor therapist um, that they can hear and listen and get ideas and then decide even for themselves like, oh, maybe this is something like for me, for example, when I was teaching birth classes, I didn't realize I was suffering from postpartum depression still currently after having my third baby until I had a postpartum specialist come in. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm checking every single one of those boxes. Like, oops, <laughs> you know? And so I like, yeah. anyways, what is the name of your podcast so that people can, can go and check that out? And I'll put at the end of this episode, you guys, I'll give you all the places that you can um, reach out to them and see all of their stuff. But I want to make mention of that right here really quick. Well, thank you so much. It's um, Empower Your Pelvis podcast. Awesome. So that is our business name, our podcast, all of the social media, um, and our website. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I feel like this could go so many different directions. I'm going to try and keep it on track so that we get through like pregnancy (laughs) and birth and all that stuff. But I'm like, oh, like even when you said fertility or endometriosis, I'm like, these could be like full podcast episodes on their own. This is (laughs) that's so neat. I love that. I never would have thought pelvic therapy for fertility like that really sparks my interest. So I feel like. We need yeah, to have that conversation. Anyone, I think here. we were even surprised when we took the course yeah. to see. I mean, we do we see a high population of infertility um, in our endo patients, but even while taking it, like we learned a lot. We dove deeper into like PCOS, mm-hmm. endometriosis, and then seeing the connection how those kind of connect with your thyroid down the road. Because we we've kind of all been like noticing that with our patients and coming up with our own theories on it. And then I myself have PCOS. I went through fertility issues. And really recognizing it and then throwing the research into it with what they found with um, IVF and IUI Mm -hmm. alone, the fertility rates of conceiving and becoming pregnant was lower than when they combined the IVF or the IUI with pelvic floor physical therapy, where we're actually manually working on the tissue and giving them exercises to increase blood flow and circulation to that area. That it was a crazy increase rate mm-hmm. on wow. um, them actually conceiving the birth. And that was what I think all of us walked away with. We all were in here on a Saturday mm-hmm. working together. Actually, that's when you announced your pregnancy. It is. <laughs> <laughs> because they now. couldn't work on me and that's I had to right. tell them. <laughs> that's right. We all were together in the clinic and we had to manually throughout the whole day, work on each other. That's right. That's all yeah. coming back. And um, increasing our old blood flow, finding out like which ovaries maybe we were a little bit more tender on, mm-hmm. or if our bladder was a little sluggish or um, our uterus was tilted. It was so fun to even realize and recognize that on ourselves so that yeah. we could create that same um, environment for our patients. And I think that mm-hmm. one really lit us all up on, we yeah. didn't expect it to be as insightful as it yeah. was. Yeah, That's so cool. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah, I have questions, yeah. but <laughs> to keep us on track. Okay, I thought it'd be a good idea if we go and like, let's talk about pregnancy. 
little bit of birth and labor and even into postpartum care. Um, and I want to ask you guys too at the end so that people know where, like I want them to be able to know where to find good care. Cause even as you're talking, um, I'm like, Oh, so not all pelvic floor therapists are going to be trained the same. And it sounds like they got to do it on their own. So I want to hear about where do you find somebody that is as skilled as you guys are, for example. But, um, so let's get started on the pregnancy if that's all right. So talk to me a little bit about pregnancy. Um, and even you guys had mentioned some external supports that you recommend for patients with a couple different issues. I'm actually wondering too, do people come to you during their pregnancy when like they've been referred when they're feeling pain? Do they come when they're feeling good to prevent? Like when do you end up seeing people? So mostly I would say we see people when they're having pain or they're having issues, whether they're like, I've, I have several patients who get sick a lot in the first trimester and they are vomiting and then they start peeing their pants. Um, so Ah. we see that side of things, um, not as commonly, but that we definitely see that we see people with pubic symphysis pain, back pain, tailbone pain, um, SI pain, pain with sex, things like that during their pregnancy. And then we do have a, I I always, I think we all really appreciate it when people come in and they're like, I'm actually not really having any issues, um, but I heard about you guys and just wanted to check and make sure things are okay. And like I had a gal maybe a week or two ago who's really active and she just wanted to make sure she wasn't doing anything to hurt herself. It's her first pregnancy. And she was like, you know, I'm going through my questions and I asked back pain. She's like, maybe a little bit, but she's not coming in here for that. She really just wanted to make sure she was doing her exercises safely. And I, I know I really appreciate it when patients come in and, um, (laughs) it's me, like, like like me, I'm always floored when people find the podcast before they're pregnant. I'm like, what? Yeah. (laughs) Good for you. It's 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 pretty incredible. And I, I think it just shows a lot that they, they're educating themselves. And I think it's incredible. And like, I had a really young gal who came in when I first started working here and she was doing great. And I only saw her like every four weeks. Um, but it was always, she loved coming in and her whole pregnancy, she did great. Like she had tailbone pain for maybe a week once and we worked on that and then it was better. And then I saw her postpartum. It was like such a fun journey to be on with her. And I think some, and I think she came in maybe at 12 weeks or something really early. And again, she was really young and I think just wanted to make sure she was keeping herself healthy during her pregnancy. So we, we see all the above. Um, we definitely get referrals from OBs, midwives for people who are having issues, um, but definitely all along. I don't know if, I mean, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah. The only other one I can think of, because I had this with my second and my third. So I always, my heart just ugh, aches for these women. But when they walk in with vulvar varicosities mm-hmm. and we have to talk about um, different products that they can wear to support that. So varicosities in your vulvar region feel like catamarans between your legs. It is just, they're swollen and full and hot and they'll come in typically complaining of pressure, pressure down Mm. there. When I get out of bed in the morning, pressure when I'm walking or throbbing and it just doesn't feel comfortable. And they they could say it after sitting for long periods of time, standing, walking, it's just blah. And so we'll take, we'll do an exam and you can see their labia just look more purple and you can see the veins kind of popping a little bit more. So that's when we typically suggest um, like a product for them. We have a V2 support that we sell out of our clinic because it's like a jock strap down there. Or you could say like a sports bra where it just like keeps the goodies up and flowing, you know, lets the blood flow keep moving. Um, just like women should probably be wearing some compression hose during pregnancy to help out the additional blood flow that we have going out mm-hmm. through our whole body. I feel for women, like I wore the compression hose because I hated the feeling of my varicosities in my legs and my vulvar tissue. My, and, um, but women still don't want to wear it. Are you wearing any for pregnancy? No, because they usually are like, <laughs> I haven't needed it. I haven't needed it. <laughs> but they're usually like, I don't want people to look at me and I don't want them to ask me what it is. And there's this like, this, yeah. I don't know, stigma, stigma around wearing compression. And then you'll see some that come in with compression, just like ankles to legs. And I'm like, that's great. I love that you did that, but you still have blood flow running from your, your knee up to your pelvis and to mm. your belly. So it would be a better support if we can get that up, you know, going full body length to support the tissue. And then 
When you have vulvar varicosities, the full body doesn't really do the trick because in the crotch, it's a little stretched out. So you add <laughs> on the V2 support to keep that junk up, right? And keep those <laughs> things up and afloat. And then, you know, that might not do the full trick. So then we add on a Bay Obey support band, which is like a sports bra for your belly. So gravity has your belly kind of hanging and kind of pulling towards the ground. That can cause, I mean, it caused me some low back pain, but my varicosities were coming in my lower abdominal region. So having that on my belly with the V2 support with the full body compression was like, man, now I can tackle the day. Mm -hmm. I feel like a million Mm. bucks. And then five o'clock would hit and you would have to take all those off because your body was like, I just want to breathe. <laughs> but those, um, and then maybe a Sorolla, a Sorolla yeah. boat. Um, People who have especially like SI pain or like pubic symphysis pain where there's just a lot of pressure or discomfort, like really low, just above the pelvis, will recommend something called an SI belt. Um, and that can be super helpful. I like to think of it as like, it's kind of just compressing the whole top of the pelvis together and stabilizing. Hmm. Um, so people who just have chronic low back pain and they have to be on their feet all day, things like that. I recommend they wear that. And that usually helps quite a bit. And like your support is stretching out while you're pregnant. So if you're dealing with pubic symphysis pain, your, your abdominal tissue stretching out and your adductors are probably getting tight. Hmm. So that causes this pool at the front of the pelvis. And that's where women can even get that lightning crotch or even yes. that um, pain with that ligament stretch with your round ligament, that if we can give them additional support and we teach them how to retrain mm-hmm. that and how it feels We go through the laying down in the bed versus sitting on the edge versus getting Mm. up versus picking up the baby weight, like leaning over and getting your laundry basket and then trying to reconnect the dots with the pelvic floor and core in the clinic. We're doing that over and over Mm. and over because we're retelling you have to retrain that brain how to connect with those muscles and teaching them that now. And then postpartum, we're getting into that very quickly because we're changing up that environment again. Once you pop that balloon and out comes baby, well, now your core is like, now what do I do again? (laughs) And so it's going through those baby steps again. It's like, you've got to re constantly reconnect here to make it function well. But if we want, need some additional support, Mm -hmm. the external garments are always very helpful. Yeah. That's that's a, really good to know. I feel like I talk about this a lot within the course and stuff, even within the Facebook group. This is like a conversation, SPD, lightning crotch, all this stuff. And I've definitely mm-hmm. recommended the belts and whatnot, but I had no idea that there were these compression things that went all the way up to your belly, like full body. This is where I'm like, yes, people need to know about you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I love that. Um, tell me a little bit about Kegels. Kegels are a thing. Right? Kegels are a thing. <laughs> They're a hot topic. They're a buzzword. Yeah, they are. And gosh, I don't know. I feel, I feel like we have felt enough pelvic floors that are pregnant and enough pelvic floors that are postpartum that the Kegel is just the contraction that is happening. And majority of the time, people are more tight down there than what they think. So it used yeah. to be taught, and this is why I say it was different with my nine-year-old and my seven-year-old years ago pregnancies that it was like, okay, ladies, we're going to do all the Kegels to prep you for birth. And now, and I remember raising my hand and nine years ago in the class and being like, um, hi, I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, actually we see a lot more tension. (laughs) I, you actually need to learn how to lengthen the pelvic floor, like elevators going up. When we Kegel, we need to bring that elevator all the way back down to the lobby because nobody lives in a hotel. Like you want to get out and expand. (laughs) And the lady looked at me and dumbfounded, like, no, honey, like we're talking about Kegels. You're going to be doing 60 to 80 a day. And I'm like, no, actually that's wrong. Like I felt terrible, but actually pregnancy hormones kind of pushed that conversation. And yes, we need to know how to work those muscles. So people typically will go into that Kegel mode, but what goes up must go down. Mm. So learning how to control, and I do say control, because when you are seated, like you're fighting gravity with picking up a Kegel or what I like to say, sucking up a smoothie through your, a straw in your vagina, you're trying to suck up that smoothie, but then you want to control that smoothie going all the way back down in the cup. And a lot of times seated, you'll feel that smoothie just plop back down in the cup, or you might feel it kind of going choppiness back down in the cup. Like it drops, it drops, it drops. And you want to work on really letting it control all the way back down so that we can get that full range of motion, just like we get with our arms and our legs. When we contract it up, AKA the Kegel, and then we let our arms relax back out or contain full length. So should those pelvic floor muscles. Yeah. So 
kind of putting that into pregnancy and delivery, a lot of our patients come in and they always say like, well, I've been doing Kegels or my doctor told me to do Kegels or whatever. And I always say, well, sometimes it's appropriate. I don't want people to think that that's, there isn't a place for Kegels because there absolutely are. And especially in different positions. Yes. Because we're not just <clears throat> laying on our back all the time. Yeah. Which so I with, feel like that's when people do Yeah. Them. But a lot of, even people who have stress incontinence or urge incontinence, which the difference is whether you are leaking urine when you're like jumping, laughing, sneezing, or if urge is like you can't make it to the bathroom, mm. sometimes Kegels are appropriate. But a lot of times, like what she was saying, when we do an assessment of their pelvic floor, Sometimes they actually have fine strength. Like they can grab around my finger. They can't let go. This is me. They can't let go. By the way. <laughs> yeah. And that's most people. And so then once we tell them that, they're like, oh, that's why I shouldn't be doing it. And it's this like light bulb of, because we get people who are 70, 60 and they're like, well, I've been doing Kegels since I gave birth. And you're like, oh my God. And they've been doing it wrong. And there's nothing, <laughs> no one who told them that how to do it. So you, you don't blame them. It's no one's fault. But it's like, okay, well, let's just retrain it. And so many of those people, and I I mean like more postmenopausal, they get so much better so quickly yeah. because mm-hmm. of that. Because they've been thinking they've been doing this thing to help themselves for years and that they've been doing it wrong. But I went on a tangent. Back to the delivery. So people who come in who are pregnant and are like, I need to strengthen my pelvic floor because I'm pregnant. Mm-hmm. And we're like, okay, yes, having good strength, you know, especially if you've been sick and vomiting is important. But preparing for delivery, those muscles need to be relaxed. Because if your uterus is trying to contract a baby out and you have, you know, I could go through different diagnoses, but like if you have a diagnosis where your pelvic floor is always tense and tight and you have pain with tampon use, sex, um, speculum insertion, things like that, your pelvic floor is not relaxing. It's going to be really hard for that baby to descend and come out. So with those people, we have to do a lot of that down training. We barely talk Kegel. We sometimes, you know, and this just depends on the person, I will have them do like a light, gentle Kegel so that they can feel what it feels like to let go. Hmm. Um, But that's, I would say more often than not what we're working on with people. And what I always tell them is the strength comes. Strength comes as we get them to relax and be able to, like what she was saying, control that descent. Um, Strength will come. And I think that puts their mind at ease because they're always like, I'm not strong. I, I have no control of my pelvic floor. Or I, I love to hear like, I can't control my bladder or my bladder doesn't work. Things like that. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I think is a huge light bulb moment for all of our patients when they walk in the door and learn that a Kegel isn't just and it, <laughs> tightening. The yeah. pelvis is so complex. Like I think people, because we do the arm motion, we think it just to be like, a group of muscles or one, one muscle that does this and this. And it's, it's a rounded structure. So it's more like a hammock or a bowl of muscles. We've got Mm. over 26 different muscles down there. And so I always explain it to the patient as it's very complex. And we've got lots of moody muscles down here who like to compensate and help. And for our pregnant and even postpartum, what we tend to see, and this isn't the case with everybody, but sometimes we get really high and tight in the back. And so people will feel the contraction more around the sits bones or the rectal area. And then the front sides, they're like our type A personalities in the back. Type (laughs) B personalities hang out in the front. They're on vacation. They're chilling. They're relaxing. That's where they might be having more incontinence because they're like, peace out. I've been chill during your pregnancy with your poor posture and your poor techniques of maybe sitting and holding baby or um, how you're sitting at work that you've had me there for nine months. I don't want to work. So we have to train them to connect the dots in different positions to let that urinary sphincter, you know, kick back on. So that might be when we want to hit a certain Kegel in a certain position, but then always remembering that release back down. But again, just making that teamwork happen down there. So type A and type B personalities (laughs) work together as a team versus them separating themselves. I love that. I think once that happens, it's nice. I was going to say, it's like powerful to hear you say this because it's like, oh, I'm not screwed for the rest of my life because I had a baby or because this is happening. Like there, I I can retrain or like we even talk about muscle memory with relaxation and stuff that it's like this learned thing. Like you can relearn, you can reteach your brain. I'm kind of loving that side of it. Also, anybody who was listening to a Amanda, when she was explaining the smoothie and trying to do that, you weren't alone. I was like sitting here like, so I'm just imagining people <laughs> listening to the podcast while they're driving being like, am I doing that? Can I do that? Which by the way, I'm not sure if I did that correctly. I say picking all. up a blueberry so much, but then like 
I mean, our hands are in pelvic floors all day long, ladies. <laughs> so what I find is when you suck up that smoothie, we want to get this first layer of your lips in your mouth. They connect with the first layer of the lips down there. So lips and lips. And when you can think of like, how would I actually suck up that straw? Your first layer of lips at your mouth suck <laughs> up and it triggers our first layer of our pelvic floor down there. So it works so much better mm -hmm. when we kind of cue our patients that way than it is a true like the claw machine that kind of comes down and comes together and lifts up. That's how it works with our straw. So love now it. You're going to be thinking lots of different things. <laughs> <laughs> For everybody trying their pelvic floor out right now, there's a couple of ways you can try it. I love it. Um, okay. What about core strength? Will you talk to me about the importance of that during pregnancy? So during pregnancy, how I like to explain it to my patients is your belly stretches. Your belly has to stretch. There's nothing you can do to avoid it. It's going to happen. But with that, your abs stretch. And so your abdominal muscles, just like any other muscle in the body, like the pelvic floor, if it gets really, really stretched out, it weakens. Hmm. So kind of going back to like what type of patients do we see during pregnancy? People who come in really early, I really love because their belly hasn't stretched very much. Their, their core is pretty much what it was before pregnancy. Obviously a little bit different. But if we start training those muscles early, then they are just going to be better set up for the rest of pregnancy and then postpartum. Um, so that's kind of during pregnancy, explaining it as it's going to stretch, it's going to happen, like diastasis, recti, a lot of women I'm sure have heard of that. It's pretty much inevitable. Most women will experience it by the end of their pregnancy. And then after healing, most of the time it does come back together. Um, sometimes it takes longer. Sometimes they need a little bit of assistance from PT, things like that. Um, but the thing with maintaining core strength during your pregnancy is you're going to make the healing process better. You're going to minimize the severity of that diastasis. You're going to feel stronger. It's going to help your pelvic floor. You're going to be able to lift baby more easily after baby comes out. Um, so it's something we work on with all of our pregnant women. We do have people who come in during pregnancy with a diastasis. Um, sometimes it can be pretty severe, especially if they've had a baby before especially people who have had a baby before, very shortly before, because <laughs> um, their body never really had time to heal very well. So we work with those women just to prevent it from getting worse um, so that they can still be functional, still exercise, still play with their toddlers and not make that any worse. Um, that's where also like those belly bands I'm wearing one right now um, come in handy because it gives you just a little bit extra support. But like what Amanda was saying, we're still training those muscles. We're not just saying, wear these supports and it'll do, it'll yeah. do the trick. We really are working with these women to, to progress their exercise throughout their pregnancy. Um, and the, the reason why core is so important, I mean, there's, we could go on forever, but your core, your diaphragm, your pelvic floor, and then your back muscles, they all work together to keep the pressure within your abdomen. I like to stay stable. Pressure is going to change. When we cough, it changes. When we jump, it changes, things like that. But all of those muscles need to work together. So like when someone walks into pelvic floor physical therapy, we never ignore the core. We never ignore the breathing, all that. So it's just kind of part of what we work on with these patients, no matter what their pelvic floor dysfunction is. And I think with our women too, having them realize like everybody's core is different because everybody's body's going through a different journey during their pregnancy. And mm -hmm. one thing that I try to instill in my ladies is like, cause they're like, well, on Instagram, so-and-so <laughs> got back or started doing this. I'm like, yes, but on Instagram, that person didn't tell you, did they have a posterior tilted uterus? Did they have an anterior tilted uterus? Like that can play into how much someone, you know, is your baby kind of growing back because their friend didn't start wearing maternity clothes until they were like mm -hmm. 36 weeks. Like their abs aren't going to stretch as much. Maybe, you know, there's so many different factors that play mm -hmm. into it that I'm, we really try to make each person an individualized journey and individualized exercise program. And then really showing them too, like each pregnancy can be completely different and reminding them like they understand, but you're going through different, like with your second, you didn't have another baby, you know, that you were constantly chasing a toddler around and that's going to change up the core, how your body's working and maybe what we need to strengthen compared to what you were doing with your first and your muscles hadn't been stretched yet. And we want that muscle memory to kick back in for the, sh the control and stability piece while they're kicking in on stretching out too. So it's really, cause I feel like social media is kind of, <laughs> it's great, but it also can be very daunting to these women with their core strength that yeah. we have to 
constantly be giving reminders for. Yeah, that makes sense. It really does. Um, you mentioned breathing and you, I know we want to talk about like birth and labor prep as well. And I, I want to hear from you guys, maybe you can explain it even over audio on the podcast, you know, like what, (laughs) tell me a little bit about breathing and what you have women do or why that's so important. Anything you want to tell me about breathing? For any type, any of our patients, not just pregnant patients, but the reason it's extremely important and we start day one um, is because your your diaphragm, I don't know if people are going to be able to see this, but your diaphragm is up here and your pelvic floor is down here. When we take a breath in, our diaphragm contracts down, our pelvic floor lengthens, so it relaxes. Then when we exhale, our diaphragm lifts back up, our pelvic floor lifts back up with it. So that's what I explained day one, and I explain it a hundred times if I need to, because most people, when they try to do a Kegel or something like that, they try to suck up and inhale. And so they're never oh, yeah, I'm definitely doing that. Pelvic- <laughs> yeah, Sorry, that is, I would say 90% of patients do that. And so when we talk about retraining, as soon as they learn that, it's like, now we just need to retrain it. Now we just need to work on that over and over and it really makes a huge difference. Um, so we want them to understand how the diaphragm and the pelvic floor are related to one another. Um, and then we just coordinate it because most people, the other thing is most people hold their breath. Um, not only do they suck in when they try to do a Kegel, but they hold their breath when they go to stand up or when they lift their baby or when they do anything. And it's something some people will be like, no, I don't think I do that. And then they come in their second session. They're like, I hold my breath all the time. <laughs> and so when you hold your breath, your pelvic floor doesn't move. Yes. And so when your pelvic floor doesn't move, well, now you don't have control of your bowel, your bladder. It's all connected. So in this population, I would say that's why breathing is so essential for people to understand. Um, and kind of like what she's been talking about with the Kegels, we we practice it in different positions because the diaphragm is a muscle. We want to strengthen it laying down, sitting, standing, moving, tabletop position, carrying things, running, running. People hold their breath all the time with running. So we'll practice mostly breathing just with like a single leg deadlift. And that's hard for them. And now we're like, now picture you're running three miles. Do you think you're breathing well? If they're not, well, the pelvic floor is not moving well either. Hmm. So it's really making that connection between your diaphragm and your pelvic floor. And then just we incorporate it into everything we do with our patients. But and, I, oh, sorry. sorry, I'm just curious, like, but it's okay to like do those things. Like running is good for you. And like, you can still do strength training where you're like a weighted squat. Like you can still do those things, right? Yeah. Ab- I mean, yeah. absolutely. Obviously postpartum, there's a, we, we like to see our patients, you know, four to six weeks postpartum and help them strengthen back up. Um, but if they're running and leaking, which is a lot of our patients who come Mm. in, you know, they start their running program again, postpartum and they're leaking urine. Mm. We take them back, you know, what we're going to do, we check their pelvic floor, we check their breathing, and then we, we strength train them in kind of a, in a progression to get them back to running safely. Okay. Um, Because we pretty much, I mean, running's a big one, but squatting, things like that. um, We say, okay, is it, is it, does it happen right away? Does it happen a mile in? We look at that type of thing. Um, so yes, you can be doing those things, but if you're having leaking or pain during those exercises, then see a pelvic floor physical therapist because <laughs> it's not normal. Yes. Um, so our four things, and then I want to jump back into the breathing, our four things that we really hone in on our patients postpartum, you can do the activity as, lo- as long as you're not having increased bleeding in those first 12 weeks. And then any leakage, any pressure, any pain. If you're having any of those, your body's telling you you're taking it too far and we need to modify because some of our patients will almost take that as a, um, like a, Ooh, I did it. And I paid my pants or, Ooh, I did it. And I had pain. And we're like, okay, that's, that's a no. We're going to have to <laughs> modify it a little bit. And then let's see, can we cut that pain by 50%? If we're still having it, we're going to modify it down a little bit more. We want to get you back to doing your activities, but we also want to do that without causing increased more leakage issues. or prolapse or any of that fun stuff. Um, one more thing with the breathing and delivery. Your breath can help calm down your nervous system. So when we're in childbirth and your fight or flight's kicking in and that fear and that pain, 
your pelvic floor muscles are the first muscles to go into tension and protection mm-hmm. mode. Even though your body knows how, it, like it has to lengthen to have that baby, it's a response to that pain. So we do a lot of training with our people, our people, our patients, <laughs> that when you feel that, let's tap into calming down that nervous system by doing some belly breathing. Maybe it's in for four, holding for seven, out for eight can be one technique. But let's see if we can calm that down to let that pelvic floor come back down to baseline so then that it can stretch its 10 times its length to help you deliver the baby. And so that's also how we like to throw it in with our prep work and mm-hmm. our, our delivery. Yeah. Uh, use it as a tool. I like that. Uh, what? Tell me some other things that you recommend for birth or that you want to speak to people for regarding birth and labor prep. My, I, I always go back to you are, pregnancy is a nine month training for your delivery and for your childbirth. So you, you essentially are in control of the training. So that's like the easiest part, right? You can decide like, even if I'm feeling crummy, I might go for a 10 minute walk because I know it's good for my body and for baby. Like that would be a smart choice. Um, I can start adding in strength training. You get to control what's happening up into delivery. Delivery, we have so many different paths we can, can, we can go, right? And we just have to know that there are multiple paths and plan for different paths to be taken. Meaning it may be a beautiful sunny day, no <laughs> rain, and it's just complete sunshine and you can see where you're going. And AKA you end up with just those muscles being stretched, which would be like a whiplash injury, beautiful vaginal birth. Or <laughs> you may end up with a huge, you know, um, bump in the road and go and you've got a little rain happening and you don't really know where you're going. You can't see the outcome. And maybe that one's a little different journey. And maybe we have some tearing down there, just like we would tear a shoulder, a rotator cuff or a knee. And so that's going to be a different outcome at the end than our whiplash injury, our stretch, or we might end up with tearing those muscles a little bit more or a cesarean. Those are all different outcomes that we, we have trained for, but if we've trained and we end up with those, like I've had a patient recently who was like, Oh my God, I tore my vagina. Like I'm ruined. I'm like, sweetheart, you're not ruined. We prepped for this. We planned for these different paths. So just know in the back of your mind, like you did everything you could and you're going to be in a better spot in that fourth trimester because you prepped your bit, your body for this and you trained for it. And she's like, you're right. I did do that. <laughs> I know you're good. And ever since then, she's been fabulous. And she just needed to come off of that. Like there's so many unknowns with childbirth. If you didn't know that, Marin, you're in for a treat. Um, but I think some of us like type A personalities prep for such the plan we want. And it's not really our plan. And it goes a different route. And we have to know that we did the best that we could to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And it'd be okay with that. And then afterwards, see a pelvic floor physical therapist (laughs) to help get you back on track to where you want to be. And know my biggest thing on this point, too, is like that I wish there still wasn't the stigma around six weeks postpartum because these women come in and I'm like with any other joint in the body, nothing's going to heal at six weeks like yours did when we have tearing or a cesarean involved. Um, so we really would need to take that six weeks away and start looking at the big picture and how our hormones are from like, I always draw a line and it's like, here's birth, here's two years, here's one year, here's six months. This is where I'm expecting us to be by six months. Here's where I'm expecting you to be at one year. And then, you know, here's two years and you may be ahead of this line or you may be after it. And that's okay too, because there's so many factors that play into it, but we're going to be your biggest support system to get you where you want to be during these, this, this whole timeline. And then they feel really good about coming in and sharing their highs and lows. And it's a trial and error game. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, we really enjoy taking that, taking that leap with them. Mm -hmm. Mary, did you, did you, yeah, I was going to say, do you have anything that I know we, like we had discussed prior to being on here, things like, um, muscle and physical strength or like perineal massage or labor positions. Like I know perineal mm-hmm. massage is like a big hot topic too. Cause I'm curious <laughs> to hear what you guys have yeah. to say about that. Cause I, the more I read, the more I study about it, the more I'm like, leave it alone is my take on it. So I want to hear what you guys have to say. So in terms of, we've already talked a lot about like core strength and all of that. Like we definitely encourage strengthening and we encourage, we encourage activity for our patients, exercise. 
you know, obviously, unless there's some contraindication to that because of a high risk pregnancy or something. But other than that, I mean, activity is great during your pregnancy. Um, and then in terms of like birth prep stretches, we always encourage, you know, like the deep squat is a great one. Happy baby, just belly breathing, all of those to do throughout your pregnancy. So when it comes to those last, you know, few weeks and then labor delivery, you want your tissues to be prepped is essentially what we were talking about. So you want those tissues to be able to relax and expand. So in terms of what we work on with our patients, we do some strengthening, we do some lengthening. Um, and then, so perineal massage, I guess we can both kind of say our opinions on it. Um, pretty much how I like to explain it to patients is it's just another way for you to address those tissues prior to delivery. It's something that some doctors and midwives will do during as well. Um, why not start a little earlier? Because you're essentially trying to train those muscles to lengthen. We are not going to stretch them out using a pelvic wand or your finger or your partner's finger or ours to the point that it's going to be 10 centimeters and baby's going to come right out. <laughs> right. It is, the idea of it is especially in someone who has a history of pelvic pain. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was going to say, it kind of depends diagnosis. It depends on the patient. But if they, if if we have a patient who's coming in for something, what's called vaginismus, where they're pain, their pelvic floor contracts with any anticipation of intercourse or pelvic exam or whatever, those people especially need to prep their tissues more. Um, Or someone who's really anxious or afraid of birth, being able to start connecting with those tissues during pregnancy when you have that sort of control and time. It's not, we have people do it for just a few minutes a day. It's not something we say, go home and do for an hour every night. Um, It's just trying to start training those tissues so they learn they need to lengthen, they need to stretch. Um, Because I feel like that's, with the Kegel, our whole conversation has been that emphasis. And so a perineal massage is just a more direct way to do it. Um, But again, it's not something that every patient, you know, we have some patients who come in and they didn't do it. And they're like, I didn't tear, I had a great delivery. Um, I actually had a a physician patient who I asked about it with. She was postpartum she had had a c-section and i asked because she does treat a lot of ob and i said what are your thoughts on perineal massage and she's like in her opinion she's like it's not going to prevent a tear if if a woman has to tear because of position or whatever it's going to happen but it will help to limit the severity of it um and then kind of the recovery of it so it's not i don't tell my patients if you do this you're not going to tear there's no guarantee of that but it's more so depending on their personality and and what, like she said, diagnosis, like what they're coming in for to see us, it could be beneficial. Yeah, I like even that you were talking about the connection, getting like mentally and physically being able to connect to those tissues prior to labor and giving birth. I actually think that is like a very key thing that I haven't even thought to teach. Um, you know, I teach breathing, I talk about release and all of that, but um, the idea of, yeah, even just being down there and connecting like with those tissues, thinking about how you can open that is huge. So I love that you just talked about that. Thank you. And the wine kind of gives them that tactile feedback too, because as they get a little further, especially our pain patients, they can't, if they can't reach down there with their thumb, then the wand, our pain or vaginismus, it helps them truly like, okay, they can feel it squeeze and tighten. They can feel it release. Can we take it down a little bit longer? And then- Mm. And then we tell them, like, keep this sucker for postpartum Mm because we're probably going to use it again. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Okay. For women that are listening then, um, and I brought this up earlier, but realizing that there are many ways that a pelvic therapist can train. um, And I I just want to know personally, like, how do I find a pelvic therapist that's going to be really good, like you guys, really trained, really educated? Where can I find those people? So we like to send people to pelvicguru.com, hermanandwallace.com, um, and then encourage them as they're reading reviews or maybe call the clinic that you find, ask them, how do you guys treat your patients? Are you guys staying in a room? Are you getting up and going to the gym? See what they, how they say they treat their patients, because I think that's big. There's a lot in mm-hmm. our not a lot. There are there's a couple therapists in our field that will still treat just in a room. And really making sure they're getting people up and doing exercises too, um, I think is key. They might be in the room and doing yoga. That's great. Um, But making it functional, I think, is beneficial Mm -hmm. as well. 
Um, just to kind of add on to that, we we do have like 15 minute free consultations, um, which will have people actually call from out of state just because they see us on Google or Instagram and they aren't necessarily looking to come here, <laughs> maybe for virtual, but we can direct them. And a lot of times people will call and be like, I don't know if this is pelvic floor, but I think my bladder's coming out. Can you help me? And of course we want to help them. So you can always call us too for like a consultation. Of course, people in our area, we encourage if they were to say that to come in. Sure. Um, but that's also, you can always, like she said, call these places. Pelvic floor therapy is a very sensitive topic and a very sensitive area. And we want our patients to feel comfortable. Um, and we totally get the hesitation. So don't hesitate to call around um, or message people or whatever. It's like we said, beauty of social media it does. Yeah, it does help that. Perfect. And for everyone listening again, I'll put all the links in the show notes so that you can contact Marin and Amanda, but also you can reach out in these other ways that they're describing here. Um, also, on top of that, you guys have been so generous. They are going to provide a free PDF for all of you that are listening. So will you talk a little bit about what's in the PDF? And then for everybody listening, again, you'll just head to the show notes and download it there or you'll get it in this week's email. So we use something called Canva a lot with our patients and we um, give out handouts just for um, certain exercises based off what their diagnosis is, what they're coming in for. And what we want to give you guys is three, there's a bajillion stretches out there, but we're going to give you three of our favorites um, that we really think address the pelvic floor really well. Um, so one of them is going to be a deep squat and we, on the handout, it also talks about variations that you can do based off of your, if you have limitations or, um, a hip injury or knee injury or whatnot, um, a frog pose, frog stretch, and then child's pose. So, um, on the handout, there's a picture of one of our therapists doing the exercises with directions on how to do them. Um, and then a little QR code that goes to our website. So if you have other questions, you can reach out to us. Um, You can actually self-schedule on our on our website, which is pretty great as well, which is the perfect segue into how can everybody find you guys? (laughs) Yeah, our website is empoweryourpelvis.com or you can scan that QR code and it'll take you right there and you can book that 15 minute consultation if you'd like. Or we have lots and lots of education out on social media. So we've got um, Instagram is empower.your.pelvis. TikTok is empoweryourpelvis. Um, we're out on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I'm starting Twitter. I've never (laughs) tweeted, but apparently that's a thing still. Um, And it's the same empower your pelvis. So, uh, we do a question Wednesday. It's wellness Wednesday. Every Wednesday you can answer or put a question in the box and then we'll answer them throughout the week. And then I usually try to make reels off of a few of those questions too, if it's one that we get a couple of them on. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that is so cool. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here with me today for hopefully empowering the women listening too. Um, But I love the care that you provide and I love that people are going to be able to be in touch with you too and learn from you, hopefully not just from this podcast, but listening to yours as well. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's it for this week, but make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you get notifications first as I drop new episode every week. And don't forget to head over to myessentialbirth.com for all of the free downloads mentioned here and to join the birth course and community serving pregnant moms just like you. If you enjoyed this and other episodes, I would love it if you would take a few minutes to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. I read every single one and include one at the beginning of each episode. See you next week.